Today's episode is sponsored by the RevOps experts at Fullcast. With me is their head of customer success, Tyler Simons. Hey, Tyler. Revenue efficiency, sales productivity are everything today. How does Fullcast's go-to-market planning platform help RevOps teams achieve these types of goals? Well, Fullcast lets you build better territories so that the right resources are always focused on the right opportunities. When reps are motivated and zeroed in on their targets, they'll be more successful and bring in more revenue. That sounds great. I do a lot of that planning in spreadsheets today and I'm pretty happy with my spreadsheets. How is Fullcast any better than that? You must get rid of the spreadsheets because (laughs) spreadsheets create lag and errors. With Fullcast, planning and updating happen automatically all in one place. Best of all, it automates all common headache inducing planning activities like territory rebalancing, account hierarchies, routing, and more. So when you're faced with those go-to-market plan changes, which, you know what? They happen all the time. Fullcast has your back. All right. You got me convinced. Where do I learn more about Fullcast? Our website, fullcast.io. What it feels like when you are part of a company from the very early days and you're one of the people, even if you're COO or president, you're still like walking the streets of the city that you built. Um, Mm -hmm. The minute I became CEO, it felt like I was in a helicopter above that city. Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. I think that earlier in my career, I just assumed that anybody with a C at the beginning of their title knew everything. They had all the answers. They knew how to handle any situation. Now, of course, this is a preposterous thing to think, but that doesn't mean that you don't look to those C-level folks for answers when you have your own questions. So, How do the rest of us who might want to sit in one of those chairs someday prepare ourselves for that moment? Is it like the matrix where we just wake up with a new title and all the required information and knowledge is downloaded into our heads? Sadly, that's not how it works. But on today's episode, we're lucky to be joined by someone who over the course of eight years grew from the 17th employee of a company to the CEO of that company. That someone is Corey Munchbach, that now the chief executive officer at customer data platform, Blue Conic. In our conversation, Corey and I talk about the relationship between a CEO and a COO. We cover the importance and the vulnerability that comes with asking questions and the traits that might hold back operators from being good CEOs themselves someday. To start though, I wanted to ask Corey about the job she had right before CEO, which was COO. I asked her to take me back to 2019 when she was promoted into that role and how she and the then CEO were crafting this important position together. For even more historical context, I joined the company in January of 2015. Um, I became COO in November of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, So about four years, almost five, I guess, really at that point, five years into being there. Um... Having started as employee 17, I think we were about 80-ish people at that time, right in 2019, thereabouts. Um, We were fundraising our Series B, so that kind of coincided with um, finishing up that process at the end of the year. Um, So, you know, having been number 17 and being at 80 with all the people in between that, um, I'd been working very closely with our founder and CEO, Bart, for um, a long time at that stage. And I had done... Um, RB fundraise with with him. So that was really the biggest kind of step up, I guess, in terms of new job responsibilities and being a part of that and being, quite frankly, just a more visible part of the company's future in, in that mm-hmm. respect, right? When you're doing a fundraise, that's the, you're, you're the first impression, the two of you are the first impression. Um, so that was kind of the backdrop of it. And then part of it structurally becoming COO was also how we Um, divided up the organization. So at that point in time, um, the way we split it essentially was that I got all of the post-sale organization, so customer success, professional services, training, enablement, so on and so forth. Uh, And I also had um, people and talent sort of operations. So that was my half. Um, Bart kept product and engineering, go to market, so sales and marketing, and um, finance was sort of the the general big biggest block split the way that we divided it, um, and then that took us through to like over the next two 
two plus years or so, I guess, was the kind of way that it worked. And you guys already had kind of, like, as you mentioned, four years of, of that working relationship together. And so when it came time to, to make those splits that you were talking about, was that kind of just a natural evolution of things that you had already been worked on or your skill sets or things you were well suited for? Or was that, hey, let's sit down and kind of carve up the organization in a, in a, in a thoughtful way now that you're in this new role? Yeah, definitely more of the the latter, actually. Okay. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is a few things. One um, is that part of why I was even in a position to be considered to do this was that he and I had spent the previous several years in a lot of ways kind of exchanging bits and parts. Um, and I built a lot of those pieces right from kind of ground up. And so um, we both, part of the need to create a separate role for me was that we were actually spending too much time working on the same stuff, right? The, mm. the overlap was was really inefficient and creating weird lines of responsibility and who owned what and things like that. And so some of it was just like a natural out, out growth of growing. Um, but because of that, to your point, it wasn't an obvious split, right? I, I say this all the time, like I have no actual skills or experience that like <laughs> would lead you to think, oh, like obviously, you know, she came from sales, so she'll take sales or something. Like, no, um, the only thing that I had sort of a semi background, I guess, in at that stage was more on the marketing side, which actually ended up staying with Bart because part of it was that, well, product marketing and I are a great fit, really the rest of marketing and I are not such a great fit. So we were really thoughtful not so much that one of us was necessarily skill set wise more suited, just more the nature of like where those organizations were. And in that case, the people and talent piece fit really well with me, right? I spent the culture of the organization has kind of been like a, a piece of me since I started. That's something that's super, super cherished to me. And I spent a lot of time on but the post-sale organization was much, much earlier in its infancy. And so um, CS was a little further along. Professional services basically didn't even exist really. And so essentially that was more of a, a build than mm -hmm. go to market and um, product and engineering were. And so that was really more the line that we delineated. We needed to make some amount of sense, obviously, coherently, that you can't just have it totally mixed. But it was actually more just the stage of it and like what was the nature of the problem. And I tend toward being both better suited for um, and enjoy more, quite frankly, kind of the newer buildy reconstruction stuff than I do the like carry it, optimize it kind of stuff. Um, and so that was really kind of what went into it. But it was very intentional, very deliberate process. It did not naturally happen that way. The relationship between a CEO and a COO is fascinating. And based on all the conversations we've had on this show, it rarely ever seems to be the same in any two companies. The split that Corey and her CEO arrived on wasn't so much skill driven, but rather driven by the need and the maturity of the functions themselves. Corey's a builder and her fingerprints are all over the parts of the organization that she helped build herself as she rose through the ranks. It also struck me that the different functions that she spent time in here helped to fill in some of her own blind spots and served as this amazing training ground for a future CEO. I wondered if that was something that she did purposefully to help make herself well-rounded, or was this part of an explicit succession plan? I would say it's kind of a blend of those two. It was not nearly the intentional, I need to be well-rounded to be a CEO. That was okay. never... <laughs> I still am like, are you sure that I should do this, everybody? <laughs> um, so uh, no, that was it was not nearly that thoughtful. What it was, though, Sean, I, I will give myself, I guess, a little credit on this is like, I really, I think, uh, I think of myself as effective because I understand the whole. Um, I'm I'm a very systems thinker type of person. Like, I need a lot of information, a lot of data to kind of make sense of things. And I think in systems and how the stuff really connects to each other. And I think that's something I both enjoy uh, and I'm good at. I'm not sure which order of that is chicken or the egg, but like I, I very much kind of, that's how I operate. And so um, I do think I have a tendency toward getting myself involved in things that I'm not familiar with or don't understand as well, um, because I think it just fills in part of the puzzle for me essentially. And so that's one piece of it. I think the other aspect, certainly at the time, and as I've grown up in the company is 
you know, my first question has always been, where do we need me? Like, what am I good at and where do I need to go? Um, in that case, again, what I'm good at is sort of the systems building it up in the first place. I'm comfortable with it not being perfect. And I can kind of iterate on that sort of thing. And so that was really just better suited to the customer org at that point than it was to the go-to-market organization or the product and engineering organization, as an example. Um, and so I think that's much more how it happened and, and where I tend to to spend time. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't because I thought it would be in service of a different role. Mm-hmm. Um, I also last thing I'll say on it, I think to be again, wherever you sit in the organization, to be a little bit more of a, a versatile athlete <laughs> Um is has just again it's like what I'm better at. I don't know this necessarily yeah. the best way to be, but for me to feel like I'm operating at my best, I really do need to have breadth uh as well as a, enough depth. Um and and so that's kind of how it ended up up happening more than anything. And, and before we jump further ahead in terms of your your progression there, I think something that would be helpful for people is when you ask yourself where does the company need me? How do you answer that question? Uh, I mean, with Bart, right? That was the the you know thing that he and I worked on. Like, would always be kind of in constant communication mm-hmm. about uh, over many years, not just in the COO role. And I know it'll fast forward to where we're going in this conversation, but just to 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 seed that conversation a bit. One of the things that is actually very difficult for me in the CEO role is like nobody's telling me where I'm needed anymore, right? It's like <laughs> I have to set all that for myself in a really different way. Um, and, but yeah, I mean, it was really over the various roles I've had at Bluconic, there's been the titles, but it's actually much more of like the functional role. What am I doing? I never was just purely in any one particular area. Um, and and candidly, that conversation is also included at times does Blue Conic still need me, right? Like, do I, am I actually serving this organization anymore? And Bart and I more than once over the course of those first, you know, now eight years, nine with, with me in the seat myself, but like four or five separate times over every two years or so of like, let's recalibrate. This is who I am. This is what I'm good at. Does the organization still need that? Does that serve us? Um, and if not, then we should have that conversation. Um, And I, again, going to the point of like weirdness of COO roles and how funky they are and how they are relative to the CEO. I think one of the reasons that I was able to be successful and why Bart and I worked so well together and why he was such a huge sponsor, obviously, of me having any of these opportunities um, was this implicit trust that we had that like I would raise my hand if it didn't feel like it was right and that he would be Mm -hmm. honest with me if we kind of reached that point. Um, and I think that's a pretty special, unique level of candor to know that you both trust each other to kind of walk away when the moment is right. Um, that's pretty special. And I think that was a big piece of how any of this was able to work over the very long period of time that it did. Pretty special indeed. I really admire this relationship that Corey had with Bart over the course of her career at Blue Conic and this transparent assessment that they would do with one another to ask those important questions. Where does the company need her? And even more frankly, does the company need her? She's incredibly self-aware and she knows the environment in which she is at her best. Which brings us to January of 2023 when Corey was named CEO of Blue Conic. Knowing what we know about her relationship with Bart, I wanted to know how did they come to determine that the place that the company needed Corey at that point was as its new CEO. That's a was Bart's decision ultimately. Like I, obviously we had conversations about it. It didn't just like come up one day. <laughs> um but it's it's was a when he was ready uh and you know he's been at this for a long time um for some backdrop right on him too right as a founder the company was initially incubated in terms of the product in a company that they had founded previously all in the Netherlands. And so when they took the Series A in 2014, um, he moved his family, young kids, the founder, CTO, Martijn did the same thing, right? Partners, wives, spouses, etc. cetera. Um, this was a huge, huge uprooting of their lives and sacrifice that they made to, to kind of pursue this Vulcanic thing. Um, and I never, it took me a little bit of time admittedly, but, but I think I caught on pretty fast of, kind of respecting that. And like, that's a whole other level of commitment and loyalty to something than, um, than I had ever been able to show. And 
the fact of having stuck it out as long as I did and being in the trenches with them, you earn, you know, earn their respect. Bart uh, used to refer to me in a way that never, I, I still don't feel like I ever deserve, but he called me kind of the American co-founder. Um, and I will be the first to tell you being a co-founder or a founder is totally different. You can call me that and it doesn't make me one, but I, it, you know, the, the implication of it was obviously incredibly generous and, and recognition of what he saw as my role. Uh, and I, I think just the, the opportunity to step into his shoes was the, the long time, um, payoff, I guess, of that again, was never the expectation was not yeah. why I did any of this, but to be in a position where the person who knows the company the best says the next person to be the best for the company is her, um, that carries a ton of weight. And that's just, I look at it as carrying the mantle on, uh, in the way that I would have, if he were still here, um, he's not, it's different. It's changed a lot, you know, all, all fine. Um, but, but that's really how it came to being. And he, when he saw that his time, when he was done, uh, I, I was the next person up and he made that case to our board, right. That had to be a decision the board made, not just a yeah. handover one day in the night. Um, and I think really that's just a huge testament to him, honestly, that his sponsorship and his voice was very full throated in support of me. Um, and then here we are. <laughs> and, you know, I'll toot your horn for you. Like obviously a testament to you as well. Right. And, and so let's like talk about that transition moment because to your, use your words, like the person who knows the company the best, like you wake up one day and all of a sudden that person's not there and now it's you. Right. Yeah. And, and you say, all right, learning how to be the most useful for the company without somebody else telling me is now kind of this big hurdle for a new CEO, a first time CEO. So how did you kind of go about when that transition happened, learning what it was to do this new job? Yeah. I mean, I'm still learning. So let's be really clear about that, that I, uh, this is, we're still very much in the work in progress part of, uh, this journey and learning it. Um, I think it was a couple things. One is, uh, first and foremost, I have the best management team that any human could ever have around them. And by definition, they have all, uh, part of what they're so extraordinary at is, being better at their jobs than I ever could be at their job. So it's a lot of just learning from them and seeking their counsel. Um, I think they know me well enough that and respect whatever I bring to the table that we can have really honest conversations and sort of learn out loud together. But I don't, I could not have done this, any of this from one minute into the seat without, without that team. Another big piece for me that I think was super transformative in terms of falling into it was there are four other um, Endeavor companies. So Visa has the different funds. Endeavor is the smaller fund. There are four other uh, Endeavor co-CEOs that I happen to kind of fall in with as a group. And the five of us have uh, talk a lot. We get together, try to get together like once a quarter, once every other quarter. Um, and that has been invaluable to me. I genuinely don't think I could have gotten through this year without having just sort of that safe space to be yeah. like, I don't know what the F I'm doing. Can someone let me know? Is that like a me problem? Is that an all of us problem? Has any, like, how worried should I be that I don't understand this? And it was so helpful. It just helped with the disorientation of being all, as you say, new in the seat, new as a CEO, um, new in a new world, right? This was not the the game I expected to play when I took the seat in terms of tech and the economy, yeah. right? Silicon Valley Bank failing was not on my first 45 day bingo card. There's like all this sort of stuff that uh, had I known I was going to be feel so <laughs> ill prepared, I might have said, you probably want someone who's going to come in with more, more uh, experience here. So I guess the long and the short of it is the way that I've navigated it, which is candidly just true of everything is uh, I am very comfortable telling people when I don't know things, I'm very comfortable asking for help. Um, 
And I have just, I'm very, very, very lucky to have so many people who are brilliant and capable and kind and understanding to say, yeah, here's how I, here's how I've seen this here, how I can help it. And going back to the point about being a systems, like that's where I have enough data. Then I can start to figure it out for myself. Like they, they've given me the inputs I kind of need to be like, okay, this is the system. This is my system. This mm-hmm. is sort of what this is going to look like for me without that though. Um, I just be like spinning around in the dark by myself, still trying to figure it out, which is, would have been very, very inefficient. So long story short, it's, it's the people that are either directly around me. I'm fortunate to have around me, the squad, whatever. Um, Lots of people have gotten a lot of questions from me in 2023. This episode is sponsored by Fullcast, the company that helps operators build better sales territories. Their platform focuses the right sellers on the right opportunities, making them unstoppable. And the cherry on top, Fullcast automates common go-to-market activities like territory rebalancing, account hierarchies, routing, and more. So the plan is always in sync with operations. With Fullcast, say goodbye to -to go-to-market planning headaches and hello to your own personal planning assistant. Learn more about Fullcast today by visiting fullcast.io. Okay, back to Corey. Before the break, Corey was talking about the people she has leaned on and the questions she has posed to those around her in her first year as CEO. She had a peer group of other CEOs, she had her management team, but to me what's remarkable is her willingness to take advantage of those groups and ask questions when you know everyone is looking to you as the person who should have all the answers. Letting your guard down with a new group of people isn't easy. So I wondered if that was a practiced or learned skill that she's honed over time. I think it's a couple of things. So one is purely based on observation over the years now. Uh, I am struck by nine out of 10 times when you have a question, somebody else also had that question. Like, mm. like of all kinds, this is nothing to do just being a CEO. And the people who are willing to be the one who asks the question end up so much smarter than the people who don't ask the question. But more importantly, when they do it in a group, which is the, I guess the more vulnerable way to do it, you make everyone else around you smarter as well, right? Everyone benefited from the answer to that question. And I think where this daisy chains together for me is that I tend not to end up in situations that I'm totally unprepared for. Like, I (laughs) over-prepare. I read a lot, ask a lot of questions. So it's the one thing that I will say I have confidence in is usually that it's a, it's a reasonably okay question. Like, like, so that's where I start. My thing is if I, if I I get get my homework, right? Like I'm not going to walk into like a, 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 you know, a calculus class and be like, tell me about numbers. I, I know enough to just not sound like a total moron, but honestly, that's a pretty low barrier to entry. And I don't think a lot of people give themselves credit for just that level of preparation. I'm like, okay, if I'm in the room, I probably like, there's enough basis to this. Let me ask the question. And what I end up with is people who want to tell you things. So that's great. I learn everybody around me, around me learns. And so that snowballs. And I think what has happened then over the course of my career, where just by virtue of being who I am in the room, uh, connotes some sort of knowledge that don't necessarily deserve, but whatever, that's fine. But what I where where it's shifted, Sean, is that before I was just doing it because I needed the information. That was like I have a job to do, or I have a goal, and here's what I know. Here's the gaps I have. How do I fill the gaps? So it was it was sort of very like break fixy. Mm-hmm. Where I've gotten to, I think better now is uh, kind of by practice be the person who is willing to be the dumb one, yeah, so to speak. That's not, that was pejorative in a way I didn't mean to be like, but be the person who has the question. Let's just go with that on behalf of other people. Even if I know the answer or like think I know the answer, if I can create more space for people to ask the questions, that's better for everybody. And I think that's where the biggest shift for me has come from. I sort of naturally did it to get my job done. Now I try to do it because I think it's better for a group or a team or an organization and I benefit from what happens next. But then the last piece of it, especially for this year, where it's all been new to me and it has been the hardest it's ever been for me to ask the questions because I don't know 
to exactly to your point, it feels like a lot more pressure if I get the one wrong and it's like, what are you talking about? Mm. But the, that's where the confidence, like you just have, you do have to just take the risk. And the example I would give on this is when the uh, group that I just mentioned, we got together for the first time and we had a bunch of topics and we had to spend this whole day with this whole agenda. And we had this amazing, we were staring, sharing information about strategic planning and all the stuff. The biggest hang up for me in my first few months in this role was like, how am I supposed to be spending my time? Like, what should my calendar look like? Do I have the right priorities? And I was trying to kind of matrix it out where it was like, okay, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I enjoy. Here's what the company needs. Like figuring out the overlap of that Venn diagram. Because on the one hand, there's shit that the company just needs you to do, whether you enjoy it or not, when whether you're good at it or not. But the thing that's so unique about this role is at some point, you also need to be your own judge of this is, I'm so bad at this that it's damaging to the company. Like, what's the difference? Like, where's that line between get good enough at it because you have to and recognize that like, yes, let the CFO handle FP&A, but you need to know the model, right? Like, so what, it, there's so much of that ambiguity. Same thing on the good at it versus bad at it. I have to do things or things, sorry, that I'm, I give me joy or that I love doing. There's plenty of stuff that I don't love to do that are part of the job. But if I do too much of that, I'll burn out, <laughs> right? So it's this like crazy calibration of how you're supposed to spend time and all these sort of things. And what I was amazed by in going to this group, I, I assumed I was the only one who struggled with that because I was new. We had the best conversation. And I talked about how I run my calendar and one, two of them now run their calendars the way I do. So going back to the point of like nine out of 10 times, other people have the question. And just by virtue of creating the space, yeah. turns out I actually was able to contribute in a way I didn't mean to, which then kind of boosted my confidence, right? And this is sort of this virtuous cycle that I think has worked well, well for me, even though the sort of nature of it has changed a little bit over the course of my career and what role I play in a given room or hierarchy affects it a bit. Um, but yeah, that's like sort of how I have navigated it. I don't know. Probably there's times where I'm too vulnerable or too stupid in front of people. But like, honestly, that's so infrequent compared to the disproportionate benefit of being the person who's willing to do it. Like it's worth it. Like, like not even a question that it's worth it. And, and I think that there's probably like really significant organizational ripple effects of that as well. Right. Put aside your peer group. Like, I don't know you that well. I don't work at Blue Conic, but I would imagine that that approach then trickles to that management team you were talking about. And then that trickles to the rest of the organization at Bluconic. And so if everybody at the company has that mindset and that psychological safety to ask those types of questions, everybody gets better, right? I mean, like that, that's that, the aspiration. A, yeah, for sure, right? Like that is the goal. That is the goal. And I will hold myself to a higher bar that I don't probably think I've manifested it fully through the org and in all the teams all the time. But absolutely what's true is if you look at some of the folks who have been most successful in their careers at the company, um, they, again, not because of me, but they naturally tend toward this as well. Like my chief of staff, who's been here, it'll be six years very soon. Um, she started as our first account manager. She's held 8 million roles between that and, and being a VP and chief of staff now. Her job changes like week to week almost because of her range in the company, but her superpower, one of many, she's an incredibly gifted person, but like her superpower is being the one who asks the question in the room. And it's, it's very similar. I think if, <laughs> if you asked her to describe it, very similar to me in the early days, she did it because she needed to know to get her job done. She was unwilling to not have the information that she needed to get her job done well, but because then she got her job done well, that boosted her reputation, boosted her confidence in herself. And now she can be someone who's asking the questions on behalf of other people and modeling that behavior. Um, and she kind of grew up that and there's so many other people like that. But it, it is a journey. I, I don't want to suggest that in your like first couple of weeks or months in a scenario, it's, it's as easy yeah. to do this as being like, yes, I will take on psychological safety for everybody. But if you are someone who is willing to kind of put the learning and put the goal ahead of your own ego or ahead of the reputational risk that can be really well suited in the right organization. Let's also be clear. There are plenty of places that I guess would punish you for that. But even still, I think it is, it is so critical to doing and you can't, it, it, as you exactly say, it catalyzes, right? It, it goes forward as you model it. Um, but it's got to start with a couple of people who just, I think 
tend toward it. And then people can learn that that's actually something that they can do as well. I love that even in a group of CEOs, just creating space for people to ask questions of each other can make a difference. And with Corey modeling this behavior within the company and also recognizing others who exhibit this behavior, it's clearly having this positive ripple effects within Bluconic itself. I also realized that we spent a lot of time talking about all the things that were new to Corey, when there's so much institutional knowledge that she brings to her new role as CEO. What the company does, who they serve, the inner workings of the company itself are all things that she's both intimately familiar with and a lot of which she built herself. Institutional knowledge can be a tricky thing. Yes, you have all this historical context to offer, but I would imagine as CEO, there are now times when Corey shouldn't be the one jumping into a project. I personally struggle with this, so I want to know how she's handling it. Some days better than others is probably the right answer to that. So a couple things. One, uh, I have had the very real gift of working with an executive coach for, for some time now. And Rob once said to me in a way that just like stopped me cold. And he said, hey, Corey you may be right and it may not matter here. And I, like I was sitting in this exact seat and I almost fell over out of the chair backward. Like I sort of that, you know, like when you laugh as you like, pro, you like just have to like, yeah. release of a, I was like, I need to call my mother and apologize for how <laughs> I've been since like age three and had words. Like I need to talk to my husband. Like I, I've never had someone so compassionately and yet brutally just tell me you may be right. And it may not matter here. And so that is constantly playing in my head of what is your point of trying to be right? And is accuracy the most important thing here? Or is someone taking ownership maybe more important, right? So it forces me to at least interrogate why I'm reacting or like why I feel like I have something to say. Um, another really good one um, that our uh, operating managing director from Vista said that is she has like a um, posted on her desk for a long time that's just said, wait, why am I talking? Uh, and I love that one too. And so I try very, 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 very hard to slow down and and be better about the, exactly the types of scenarios that you're describing. The other side though of the institutional knowledge that I, I'm also very hyper aware of is just because I know it intimately doesn't mean it's actually right or serving us anymore. So there's also mm -hmm. this element of like, I wanna make sure that just because uh, it worked one time or was working for a long time that I'm not, telling people not to, or, or somehow in interfering with people coming in and having a really good recommendation for why we should change something or do it differently or, you know, whatever the case might be. So it's, it's baggage on, on both sides of, you know, you want people to just like leave it alone and move forward, but also can potentially prevent me from seeing an opportunity to improve and move past things that we've done um, that don't make mm. sense or don't serve us anymore. So, you know, I spend a lot of time, uh, it, that occupies a big spot on the shoulder, kind of in my ear, like just before you speak, think, think about this and slow down. Um, one of my real goals for this year was just, you know, stuff will come in and I would be prone to just responding to it and getting it moved on. I am, I'm actually very proud of myself for the amount of restraint that I have very deliberately inserted into how I operate, even if it makes me so uncomfortable to just leave it in the inbox or come back to it later or wait for someone else to respond in a group Slack, things like that, or go to somebody else and have that. It is not always comfortable for me, but I, I do work really, really hard at it. And uh, I, I hope people, <laughs> I hope they don't notice it in that respect. But like the people who've known me for a long time, I think do kind of see the difference. Um, the, the analogy I would use, and I, I may have said this to you before, Sean, is what it feels like when you are part of a company from the very early days and you're one of the people, even if you're COO or president, you're still like walking the streets of the city that you built. Um, mm -hmm. The minute I became CEO, it felt like I was in a helicopter above that city. And it's like the exact same thing. It's so familiar to me. I know all the nooks and crannies, but I am suddenly at a totally different perspective, different altitude. I can see how the pieces work together in ways that I could never see before. But I'm also unable without like, is this a, is it worth a parachute in, right? That's the question. Like, do I, I only way to get down is to parachute down. 
are you sure? Because it's going to be take a minute for you to get back up. It can be very disruptive and distracting. All of that is true. And so that's kind of how I'm I'm figuring out how to how to navigate that. Um, but it was so striking to me. It still is the way in which something that feels so intimate and so part of me and that I feel so part of it, it just shifted entirely kind of how I interacted basically in a matter of like hours, days from from pre pre CEO to post in, in, it was, it's pretty remarkable, honestly. (laughs) I mean, it is remarkable. And I think, you know, your self-awareness around it too is, is very admirable. Um, I just rolled my eyes for anyone who's can't see this visually that, that (laughs) (laughs) sorry sorry to compliment you. I apologize. I I don't know that it is. I'm, I think I, I still feel like that self-awareness is such a work in progress. That's the, that's the reason I react that way is I feel like, I, I imagine there's plenty of people who would be listening to this who know me are like, God, she has so much work to do. Like, they're, they're, they're right. <laughs> they are, they're so, totally right. But so know that I am working that, on it. I'm trying. Let's talk about that then. Because like, you know, I think anybody who's been told they have a strength or a superpower at some point has also been told like, this thing is also your weakness. 100%. Right? And, and so like, if we kind of extrapolate that to ops people in general, right? Like, it feels like the dynamic you just described would be something that would make it hard for an ops person to be a CEO. Mm. Right. And so how, how do you agree with that? Like, do you think that ops people would have to kind of check that part of how they think and how they work in order to become a CEO? I would say, and I, I guess I can't say this empirically, but my, I have a, I have a hypothesis that basically becoming CEO asks you to dampen a lot of what got you there in the first place and heighten the things that prevented you or didn't get you there in the first place, right? It's, it's, it's sort of like this not regression to the mean necessarily, but there's this element of you need to, yeah, you need to kind of correct for the extremes. You need to find more of a middle ground. There's an amazing article uh, from HBR a couple of years ago, and it's called The Authenticity Paradox, which gets it exactly this, this whole concept of like, you're supposed to show up and you're supposed to be trustworthy and people need to be able to relate to you, right? You need to be your authentic self in the workplace. And yet you need to know where that has to stop, either because it's too much for some reason or I think this is closer to what you're describing. It's because it's actually getting in your way that you you can't, it's a different skill set. And so this balance, I would put it differently, like this balance between sort of authenticity and adaptability. Um, mm. and, and I would say I over-index on authenticity and under-index on adaptability. That's the one I need to be better at calibrating how I show up. And what the energy is kind of associated with that, right? If you're constantly doing the one that you're not good at, you're going to just, you can't sustain that. It's too much. On the other hand, if you are sort of dogmatic that like, well, I just, I'm the snake that, you know, just morphs or the, you know, the chameleon for whatever situation, no one's going to think you're authentic. But if you're just like, sorry, tough shit, this is who I am, take it or leave it. Like, nope, they're going to leave it eventually. And so I, I do think there's this element of like, if your role necessitates or your company, the context, whatever has required of you to sort of be really one, it's, it's likely going to be a blind spot that you need to improve on the other. And again, I think for, for anyone who's in a broad based role, CEO or otherwise, right? But where you're dealing with a wide range of personalities, cultures, languages, team types, whatever, you're, you're going to need to be able to dial up and dial down. Um, and I think the skill that is, is knowing how much to dial up and to dial down based on what you're trying to do. Um, and if there's a science to that, I'd love to know what it is, but so far for me, it has not felt very scientific at all. (laughs) Before we go at the end of each show, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months. Oh, can I pull up? Can I look at my list? So I'm Please, I'm four course. books away from hitting my 52 on the year goal. Oh my I will say we just finished reading Hidden Potential um, by Adam Grant. His newest one was yes. for Blueconic Book Club, um, and it was excellent. So I strongly recommend that. I think in the last six months, my probably my favorite one 
uh, was Demon Copperhead by Barbara Copper uh, by Barbara Kingsolver. It's the Appalachian adaptation of uh, Dickens's David Copperfield. And it is heavy. It is hard. It is brutal. It is like one of the most exquisite books I've read in a long time. So on the nonfiction side, I'd go Hidden Potential. On the just overall kind of amazing, uh, Demon Copperhead it gets my gets my vote. You're the second person now to recommend Demon Copperhead to me, so I'm gonna have to. I'm it's, gonna have to open it up. You you need to be emotionally ready for it, but it is it's staggeringly impressive. Really, really amazing. Um. All right. I'm going to keep you in the ops kind of family here with these next couple of questions. You're, you're definitely still, still with us, regardless of your title. I hundred percent. I once, once people, always people. <laughs> Favorite part about working in ops. Oh, the, the variety, the range, like you get to deal with so many different types of people. It is like a hotbed of learning and exposure to new problems. It's like a microcosm of all the things going on around the company. And I love that. That's my favorite part for sure. Flip side, least favorite part about working in ops? Um, it can feel like you're running in a lot of different directions a lot of the times. I think being feeling like you're kind of peanut buttered and the priorities might change and you worked on something that you have to like kind of throw away. I think you're, you feel that shift uh, more intimately than probably most other people in the organization do. For sure. Someone who helped you get to the job you have today. <sighs> That's like an unfair question. All the people, <laughs> like all the people. I think if I had to pick, I can't, I mean, I truly can't pick just one because it, one didn't do it. It's just, there's so That's many fine. amazing human beings. I will say that probably the person who started the journey though was David Cooperstein, who hired me at Forrester Research um, when I told him I'd be there for two years and was going to get my PhD in public policy after that. And he still hired me to be a research associate on the CMO and marketing leadership team. Uh, if that hadn't happened, uh, there's no way I'm here. I would have taken a very different path, very, very different journey that would not have ended here. So I think Coop gets credit for tons of sponsorship and advocacy and also for kind of being the first step on this, this journey that got me here. That's awesome. All right, last one. One piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. <laughs> I feel like we just did 40 minutes on that, but uh, <laughs> one piece um, of advice. So my piece of advice is, um, uh, Rob also said this to me once that a leader without a follow without followers is just out for a walk. I think there's this perception that to be a senior leader, or CEO, or other, that it's all about pleasing the people above you, your board, or your investors, or whatever. Um, it's a much more satisfying journey, and I would say a much more sustainable one. Uh, if you are doing it for the people you work with directly or work below you, so to speak, in sort of the hierarchy. So my advice is don't get too hung up on what the people above you think about you, even though that seems to be the vanity metric you're going after. Um, it will happen if you get the kind of support and uh, belief of the people below you. That's what really creates long lasting success. And that success is what will propel you into bigger, higher roles, not the people who think that you're doing a great job just because they're looking at you down on high or from a remove. Thanks so much to Corey for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. Also, special shout out to RJ Filipski for introducing me to Corey in the first place. If you like what you heard on today's episode, make sure you are subscribed to our show so you get a new episode in your feed every other Friday. Also, if you learned something today from Corey or from any of our guests, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Six star reviews only. All right, that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Today's episode is sponsored by Fullcast, your go-to-market planning platform. If you've ever spent hours or days building territory and quota plans only to have them be out of date the second the reps hit the street, you need to check out Fullcast. With Fullcast, you set intelligent rule-based policies that automate all of the time-consuming manual tasks that hit RevOps teams throughout the year. With virtually no effort, operations will always seamlessly align with your plan. Learn more about Fullcast today by visiting fullcast.io.